Hello, welcome to our live Balkans Focus Google Hangouts. I'm Glenn Cates for RFURL and Pride. Well, much of the world's attention was focused on a manhunt in Boston last night. And of course, last night authorities captured suspect number two in the Boston Marathon attacks, Jokar Tsonayev. But in the meantime, on the other side of the pond in Brussels, a breakthrough agreement appears to have been reached between Kosovo and Serbia in their 10th round of talks. The agreement is meant to normalize ties between Serbia, Serbia and Kosovo and settle the status of the Serb-dominated area in northern Kosovo. EU High Commissioner Catherine Ashton, who presided over the talks, called the deal a step away from the past and for both of them, a step closer to Europe. But the pact is not yet assured. Both sides have to agree in writing by Monday, and Kosovo Serbs have called for a rally protesting the agreement. So what happens next? To discuss, we have a great panel from across Europe. In Brussels, our Fiorel correspondent, Ricard Juzviak, who's been following the negotiations every step of the way. In Belgrade, Branka Trivis. And in Pristina, Abana Vidishici. So, without further ado, I'm going to get this started. And uh, Ricard, I'm going to start with you. Just tell me what happened next week and uh, this week and uh, where the breakthrough came. Well, the breakthrough really was about uh, last talks were actually very short but intense. It lasted just four hours, which is actually not that much considering that we've been having marathon sessions throughout this year. And what they really talked about was one point, the now famous point 14 in this 15 point document they agreed on. And it was basically about um, the blockage of um, the potential blockage of Kosovo when it comes to joining international organizations and uh, in the end they agreed that just they just mentioned the EU the name of UN was there sometimes and even OSCE but in the end they just agreed that this is a, a facilitation that is led by the EU and they should focus on the EU and what comes uh, later will, will basically be decided at that point so in a sense it was um, very short actually and they sort of picked up uh, where they left on Wednesday when they were on the cusp of a, of a deal anyway. Yeah so just on that point what are the practical implications of that recognize allowing not blocking them for EU movements but on the international level what like practically what are the implications of that? It is really hard to tell right now to be honest with you it means probably that uh, in a sense that uh, Kosovo should be able to you know, somewhat clinched this SAA, the Stabilization and Association Agreement, which is sort of like, let's say, a formalization of relations between European Commission and, and uh, or the EU and, uh, and, and Kosovo. But uh, there are more difficult steps ahead. So this is a very small step uh, on what yet going to be a very long journey for Kosovo and actually Serbia to finally join the EU. Um, so Ricard says it's a small step. Branka, is that how people see it in Belgrade? Uh, if you mean uh, this agreement around this famous uh, point 14, I don't think that anybody in Belgrade has been dealing with that, you know. But uh, when it comes to the Serbian negotiating team, it seems to be very important, you know, because they obviously intend to uh, to be blocking Kosovo on its way towards the, the United Nations, you know, to stop Kosovo becoming a member of the United Nations. Um, on the other hand, they agreed to accept this changed formulation of this point 14, meaning not stopping Kosovo towards its path, on its path towards the EU. Because, you know, every member of the EU and uh, if Serbia should become a member of the EU before Kosovo does, then Serbia gets the right to veto Kosovo's accession towards the EU. So in a way, I think it should be important to Pristina, you know, that it in a way uh, uh, secured that uh, this hurdle won't exist on its way towards the EU. But uh, Saying that, I think that Serbia's decision to go on blocking Kosovo on its way towards the EU is a very wrong one. And I think Serbia will actually have a boomerang effect pretty soon on this, if it continues doing this. And I suspect it will. 
Uh, Aban, is that how you see it? Uh, we, we have a problem actually within the Brussels with five EU member countries that do not recognize Kosovo. Now the first step should be to overcome that. Those five countries should recognize Kosovo. And this is where I see, if I can call it like that, EU's fault for not uh, being able to, to gain the, <clears throat> the concession of those five remaining EU member countries. Even now in Kosovo we have the EU mission rule of law here that uh, is status neutral, which is kind of awkward because uh, they, they, they oversee the judiciary and they oversee the rule of law in general and uh, they, they don't recognize Kosovo's independence, Kosovo as a state. So first, the biggest, the, the biggest step in this regard is the, for those five remaining member countries to recognize Kosovo and then the journey will be taken from there and I presume that, that the, the whole issue, the whole process has just begun actually, it hasn't ended. Arbana, if I may, excuse me, if I may just add I think uh, a very important uh, little thing to this. If I'm not completely wrong, I read these days that uh, Slovakian authorities and also Romanian uh, kind of announce their change of attitude towards the independence of Kosovo if Serbia and Kosovo come to a deal, which has happened, right? So I would expect a big, you know, sort of change there. That, you know, after this, Slovakia, Romania, perhaps Greece and Cyprus might be a little bit tougher, but uh, you you can expect a more a more flexible policy in these countries towards Kosovo, towards Kosovo's I, independence. If I might chime in, there, may, 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 may I come in? Uh, yeah, sure. I, I actually think it will be quite hard. Um, I already, because uh, on Friday evening, uh, directly after the, uh, the deal was struck, EU ambassadors met uh, in Brussels uh, to get a briefing from uh, the right-hand man in this talks uh, of Ashton, Mr. Gentilini, and uh, they were obviously jubilant, they didn't congratulate, them, but already at this very first meeting, both Spain and Belgium started asking questions about the deal already when it was fresh. Uh, and I think actually we talk about Slovakia, we talk about Hungary, uh, we, we also talk about Greece and Cyprus, but I think there are real questions to be asked all over Europe where we have separatist, separatist tendencies. I mean, Scotland will have a, a referendum on its independence in two years. In Spain, uh, Catalonia is making real noises right now, so I think it will really be hard to make these countries more flexible. In fact, I actually think there are more countries, perhaps even Belgium, that start asking questions about what this really means in a, in a more general sense. When you say asking questions about what it will mean, do you mean how, how it has implications for their own futures? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we're, what we're seeing right now is a wave of um, separatist feelings in, in Europe. We, ha we have it in Bologna and Flanders in, in Belgium. We have it very much with Basque, Basque countries in Catalonia in Spain. We have it in Scotland when it comes to Great Britain. So uh, these questions will, will definitely not disappear. In fact, it, I think it will intensify very mo much more and it will become a very much uh, a question of uh, really how we're going to deal with localism and separatism very much more in the future. Can, uh, Brenda, can you tell me about uh, how people are reacting to this on the street? I, you know, they, in the Serb-dominated northern Kosovo, one of the leaders has called for a referendum. I, how, how is this going to be pushed to people, in, to Serbs in northern Kosovo? Well, I think the, 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 the toughest nut actually and uh, the most dangerous hurdle to the agreement are going to be Serbs in, in northern Kosovo. And as you mentioned uh, in the beginning, there, there was a, already a protest in northern Mitrovica where members of uh, this nationalist radicalist Serbian radical party, Shashel's party, actually uh, called this capitulation, you know, and they at the same time called upon the President of Serbia, Mr. Tomislav Nikolic, and Serbian citizens to block this capitulation, as they said, you know. So, uh, the tough nut actually is going to be implementation 
of, of this agreement. Because those who are supposed to implement it are the very Serbs in the north. So I have to I have to tell you honestly that I'm afraid of their reaction. I'm afraid of protests, you know, more massive protests. Now we have the weekend, so things are not flared up yet, but uh, I'm very much afraid that we are going to see a lot of mess in, in northern Kosovo. Uh, when it comes to the Serbian authorities, you know, to all the parties who make up this ruling coalition, I don't see much space for you know, for, for, for attitudes that are going to separate them. Even Tomislav Nikolic, who is considered to be the most conservative element of this ruling coalition, said that this was the most that Serbia could achieve for Serbs in Kosovo. So, uh, there is no fear that, that, that the authorities, that the top authorities are going not to be united, you know, in, in so, their so, attitude. So can, yeah. can we all agree that on, on Monday this is going to be signed and sent back to the EU? Is that, is that, is that a definite? Yes, I do expect that, because uh, the ruling coalition has a pretty comfortable majority, you know. So they, are, they don't have any reason to be afraid, you know, when it, when it comes to the parliament and adopting it in the parliament. And I do expect it to be signed on Monday, yes. And Abana, uh, I mean, how are how are people reacting to this in, in Kosovo? I assume the reaction's been a little bit different, at least from what I've seen. It, it, they have been actually conflicting and confusing. I've chosen uh, the leading newspapers for you today, guys. I don't know if you can see it. This is like the leading newspaper in Kosovo, and it says normalization, historical normalization under the quotes. Uh, and the second one, also leading newspaper, it has all the in the dots, and the red ones are uh, the risky ones, the, the risky points. It's point 0.1, point 0.5, point 0.12, and point 0.14. Uh -huh. So they, they see those points as the risky ones. So uh, the opposition, uh, the uh, opposition, one of the leading opposition political parties here, has absolutely objected to the deal and has called for protests, but they are still to determine their steps, what they're going to take. The parliament is going to convene tomorrow night at 8 p.m. to ratify it, and I expect some very heated debates there. And, and you said, uh, can you go through, um, what are the, sort of the biggest conflict points, at least for on the Kosovo okay. side? Okay, uh, one of uh, it. The first one goes about the association, and uh, which is called Association Community. The fact that it has to go by two names is not satisfiable. It, ha it should have had a name, one, either community or association. In Pristina, the association is deemed as some, some kind of an NGO, and in Belgrade, uh, the, the uh, community, or as they call it in Serbian Zajednica, uh, that has more legitimate powers. It, may sound ridiculous, but in vocabulary terms, it, is, it, it does make a difference. Uh, the point five that they deem as risky uh, is about the association that will have additional competencies re uh, re uh, dependent on the, the delegation, the, depending on how the central authorities are, have been delegated to them. Point twelve is the election, local elections to be overseen by OSCE. And point 14 is uh, about, as uh, Ricard and Branca have already talked about, is about the Kosovo's uh, membership to uh, international missions and organization, which has actually been only now simplified to EU integration, and that's it. And uh, I've been just talking to uh, some analysts here. What another point that has not been um, and it has not been in time to, to evaluate it as risky, but it is very risky. It's point eight. It's about parallel structures, and it, it's about incorporating the parallel, uh, incorporating the Serbia's security structures into Kosovo security structures. Now that's going to be a real challenge. Yeah. And uh, Ricard, this actually brings me to two points. Uh, when they're talking about negotiations, um, do, do actual tools for implementation come up? And, um, and that's the first question. The second question is, you know, Serbia, if a deal wasn't reached by Monday, could have set back their integration um, into the EU 
by a year or two. Um, how did that give Kosovo um, an upper hand in the negotiations, and, and how did they sort of reach this final deal? Well, when it comes to the implementation, that, that is still the, the big question. I mean, how is this going to be implemented? There, there are talks in this, uh, I think, I don't know if it's point 15, that there will be some sort of implementation committee overseeing this. But what we have known that, um, from the previous rounds, that they have struck previous deals as well about the integrated border, boundary management, and the implementations on all these deals that Serb and Kosovo have struck before has been a bit sketchy to say the least you know so the implementation will be a big question and that will also be finally uh, the question which other countries especially Germany Britain and the Netherlands which are a bit skeptical about granting Serbia uh, a start of negotiations um, they will really see that this is going to happen so actually what we will have to look at from now till June when the final decision will be made by your heads of states is whether there will actually um, be some sort of implementation and this is where Serbia really have to pick up its game I reckon uh, when it comes to upper hand or not I'm not really sure it was Kosovo who had an upper hand in this sense it was more basically that Serbia realized that uh, the train might leave them uh, for, for some considerable time and they were actually in a sense realizing that they have to sign up to something very soon otherwise it will take till December again till they will be able to talk about uh, getting a starting date. Mm -hmm. And uh, but, sorry there's some background noise you know we're, we're getting some um, we're getting a few comments on Twitter I have Drive Europe News asks and this is actually a fair question. How long before Serbia is actually in the EU? <laughs> well, uh, okay, it's going to be at least eight to ten years, you know, at the very best. I mean, nobody here expects it to happen before 2020 or even 2022. So it's, it's going to be a, a long journey to become a member of the European Union for Serbia. And, uh, well, uh, but, uh, but it's uh, very, on yeah. That, on that point, um, you know, support for EU integration has gone down, um, you know, significantly in Serbia since the discussion first came up. How long, how much will is there among the, um, in Serbia to, to, to sort of wait it out? You know what, it's very controversial actually, all these polls that have been taken lately. Why? When you ask people uh, how they appreciate the importance of Kosovo, you know, being a priority, Serbia's priority, Kosovo actually rates very low, you know. It's not among the first four or five priorities. On the other hand, if you ask them, whether they would trade Kosovo for Europe, then Kosovo, the Kosovo issue comes higher, you know. So uh, all these polls are not really to be taken too seriously. And uh, I don't think that, you know, like uh, on the average citizens of Serbia are very heated when it comes to you know, Kosovo de facto not being part of Serbia since at least 1999, you know. I mean, it's clear to people, it's clear to ordinary people. What happened in, in the last four years when Democratic Party was leading the governing coalition, when Mr. Tadic's party was uh, in, in office, you know, uh, they, they were simply not courageous enough to do what this government did, you know. And it may be, you know, strange to, to lots of people because these guys used to be, you know, part of, of, of the Milosevic's bloc, part of the nationalist bloc. Ivica Dacic was Milosevic's spokesperson. Uh, Vucic and Nikolic were part of, 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 Serb of the Serbian Radical Party. So these guys simply decided to be more pragmatic and decided to say, to say, okay, I mean, this issue is taking too long. This issue is going to leave Serbia without inhabitants, you know, if we should frozen this conflict for the next 10 or 30 years. And they said it very clearly, especially Dacic, that 
he will not leave, it, leave, it, leave this problem to the next generation to solve. And they delivered, you know. And what is very significant <laughs> yesterday and today, Democratic Party hasn't even congratulated to the team who, you know, reached the agreement with Kosovo. It's absolute silence, you know, in, the, in, the, in their roles. No word about it, as if nothing happened, which is not good, of course. So, so I mean, so, so, uh, so what does that silence mean? I mean, uh, that silence means that this party lost its political credibility, if you will. You know, I mean, this was the top uh, national priority, if you will, to solve the Kosovo issue, which has been on the table for 100 years. And now it's definitely happened. Okay, it's, it's still just a paper. The implementation, as we said, is going to be a problem. But, you know, it's not a small thing to reach a historic deal, you know. For, it's not a small thing for the two prime ministers to sit at one table and to reach a deal, you know, after just several months. And, you know, the party who was in office until yesterday didn't say a word. This party just lost legitimacy, you know. I mean, what, is, I mean, what other priorities is this party going to tackle if it just didn't utter a word about this? And uh, Abada, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go over to you. I, you know, I assume maybe it's too early to start. Um, you, you talked about the press, but how do you think the political parties are going to react to, to this deal? Which parties? The, the, uh, the opposition. Of the opposition. Um, as I've said, the, the parliament is expected to hold a session tomorrow night, which is Sunday, 8 p.m., to ratify the agreement before, uh, to approve the agreement before uh, Monday, before it's sent back to EU High Representative Catherine Ashton. Um, uh, I, the thing is that the opposition is also divided. It's, uh, the coordinator of the dialogue comes from a small opposition party, but he's there, and he was in Brussels. It's Mr. Blerim Shaya, who has been a member of the delegation. Now, then you have uh, two other political parties which are in opposition. One is uh, the Democratic League of Kosovo, and they have been supportive of the agreement, but with reservations, with some opposition. And then comes the uh, self-determination movement, uh, headed by Albin Kurti, who are, I must say, very uh, engaged in organizing protests, and this is a group that gathers younger people. Uh, even on our website, on Kosovo's unit website, the, uh, basically the commentaries I was receiving in forum was confusion, and they uh, they didn't deem it as historic as uh, the government did. So I presume we're also going to have some some issues, political interpolitical issues. But of course, the biggest problem I presume will be Kosovo North. Uh, and Amanda, sorry. No, go ahead. All right. I was just about to ask Abana whether Mr. Tachi has a comfortable majority in Parliament. I mean, how shaky or... No, okay, the, the government is not at risk of any... They, they, he, he does have a, a majority in the Parliament. The, the issue is how will he control the dissatisfaction outside of the institutions. I'm talk, I've, I've talked about self-determination movement who is very active in organizing the protests in the streets and we have had so many protests, not for this dialogue particularly, but for so many reasons. And the, in my view, in my opinion, the biggest issue will not as much be the domestic politics as it will be northern Mitrovica. That's where the problems will begin. I absolutely agree with you. And I'm not, I'm not sure myself whether Dacic, Vucic and Tomislav Nikoric will be able to control what is likely to happen in Kosovo's north in the next days or months. And when it comes to implementation, yes, it's absolutely true what you Richard say, that the European guy said that, you know, the paper is not enough, that the implementation is going to be the key for Serbia to get the start or the accession, you know, the starting date of the accession talks. On the other hand, 
don't you think that it's too little time until end of June, say, to show the results of the implementation? I mean, uh, the election in, in, in Kosovo, the local election in Kosovo is yet to happen. And I don't think it's going to happen in June. Right, Armana? I doubt that. I seriously doubt that. Right. So, what are we talking then when we are talking about the results of the implementation? You cannot implement, you cannot implement all this, you know, without newly uh, uh, organized elections, local elections in Kosovo, in, in the north of Kosovo. So, Ricardo, what's the next step? How do we determine um, whether, it's, whether the outline of this plan has or has not been implemented? Well, this is an interesting question, and I think this is a question that actually will be determined more in Berlin than in Brussels, actually, because for, for a very long time, Germany has been the big skeptic when it comes to uh, Serbia getting any first candidate status and then a date for candidate status. So I think if, if it was just up to Brussels, uh, Serbia would already be negotiating for EU membership. But Berlin are very skeptical. It may have also to do that it's an election year in, in Germany in September and they will appear strict, not only on economic matters but also when it comes to enlargement. So um, Berlin will be very fickle. So I think right now what we should focus our intention on from now till June is uh, what Guido Westerwelle, the German foreign minister, will say about this and also what sort of noises are coming out of Berlin because that will be the key player when it comes to uh, to Serbia getting a, a, a negotiation date or not. And, you know, something that after after negotiations ended yesterday, Prime Minister Otachi said um, the agreement marked the recognition of Kosovo's territorial integrity. And I think that brings us back to what Ricard said a little bit earlier about um, other um, EU member states that have their own sort of territorial disputes within the countries. Um, how much? How much is a statement by Ta Tachi an accurate statement? You, I mean, how far uh, does it go towards saying to the international community, Kosovo um, is uh, Kosovo is a sovereign nation? Is that a question for me, to ask? Uh, yes, for you first. Um, well, it's understandable that the political leaders we will use this kind of a rhetoric for domestic use. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen extremely controversial statements yesterday when the dialogue ended by Prime Minister Baci and then by Prime Minister Dacic. One was saying the other uh, one thing and the other the other thing. So um, I don't think it's a recognition from Serbia. Um, uh, I think uh, we should we should evaluate the positive steps of this agreement that at least they've sat down and communicated maybe in maybe sometimes with uh, a high uh, uh, with high tones and whatever it was reported from Brussels but they sat down and they discussed now the agreement has been evaluated as a landmark agreement by all major international polit political players Ban Ki-moon the UN secretary general John Kerry the US state, uh, secretary of state uh, Elliot Engel, the U.S. congressman, uh, but and but then if you see carefully their statements, one can see that every one of them is asking for some measures to be taken in implementing as possible and as loyally as possible this agreement. So everybody would now look into the implementation process, which again I'm saying it has so many obstacles in front. And I, I, speaking just again on, on sort of the commentary that came out after the negotiations, uh, this is being called uh, normalization. Um, would, would Branka, would you agree that this is a normalization? I would. I definitely would. I mean, uh, this is we are supposed to, to to put this in in you know in in a historical content, and I think this label as a historical agreement, this tag, you know, that was, you know, repeated 100 times at least yesterday, was no exaggeration, you know. I mean, these two countries, these two entities were at war just 14 years ago. And now we have this agreement on the table. What happened actually was, regardless of, of the fact whether Serbia and Kosovo will 
uh, you know, exchange ambassadors in the near future or not, Serbia relinquished its control over the north of Kosovo. And uh, it's definitely so, you know, it's going to be structures locally elected there. Uh, it's going to be Kosovo's within Kosovo's judiciary, judiciary and Kosovo's internal police system. Okay, you know, one entity of the judiciary or one unit, if you will, an appeal court is going to be in, in, in North Mitro, Mitrovica, a regional police commander and local police commanders will be served because it's, it's municipalities, you know, with serve majority and so on. But, I mean, this is the f actually the first government which said, which said, okay, we are giving up the parallel structures that had been in Kosovo, you know, for, 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 for 30 years, you know, if you want. So, I mean, it is normalization, isn't it? So, but, yeah. So you obviously, I mean, you obviously think this is very historic and, and uh, there have been mixed accounts about mixed accounts about how historic this is, and this is for everyone um, on the spectrum between non-recognition and recognition. Where does this normalization that we found yesterday? Where does this fall? Where 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 are we in this process towards uh, recognition? I would I would uh, say just a few steps away from the non-recognition, not as close to recognition as yet. Uh, we still have a long way to go, and when we speak about normalization, it's funny about this that you ask, Len, because they, when this work came out, the normalization of agreement, I think it was it, it just came out uh, because nobody knew how to name this dialogue. Uh, when would I call it a normalized relations? When I feel free to travel to Serbia. For the moment, I don't. Uh, sorry, say that again? Uh, when will it call it a normalized relations? I would call it personally when I feel free to travel to Serbia. For the moment, I don't. Okay. Uh, is it, how come that wasn't... No, no, no. Um, Ricard, and what about, what about you? What, what does normalization mean? I, I actually completely concur with Arbana. This is uh, normalization, I would say, is when uh, young Serbs can go to Pristina and uh, have a beer and hang out with um, Kosovo Albanians, and Kosovo Albanians can do the same in Belgrade. Okay, so, uh, so uh, I'm going to start getting some of the Twitter questions we have, near, um, have here. I'm going to start with a somewhat fun one from Alban K. And, um, this person asks, will the two PMs be invited at one of the next EU meetings for a family picture? Uh, <laughs> Anyone? No, no, they're yeah. not part of the family yet and won't be for a while. So uh, they are distant cousins, perhaps, but uh, not mm -hmm. more than that at the moment. And uh, I, have a qu I also have a question from Luke Gensler. And, and I think this question gets into, uh, Ricard, what you talked about at the beginning but other um, EU member states that have territorial disputes. He says, um, will the political will shown in Serbia and Kosovo have a positive impact on other politicians in the region? And actually, let me step back when I said, reading it again, I, you know, this is, as Albana said, perhaps a very historic deal. Um, two sides made some pretty significant compromises. Uh, you know, does this affect how other EU leaders interact with each other? And actually, how did this still get done? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the whole EU is one big compromise, isn't it, really? I mean, uh, we, we tend to forget sometimes that, uh, um, you know, France and Germany were at each other's throats for hundreds of years, and now they are basically being invited to take decisions on each other's behalf, you know, so... It's very much, in a sense, Tachi and Dachis were very much like EU leaders in, in many respects uh, during these talks, both in uh, the way that they have to make painful compromises in which no one really wins. And the other thing is that they sit for hours and hours and sometimes don't get to get anything done, really. So it's, they're, they're very much getting into this sort of EU uh, mood of, of, of opera modus operandi, I would say. Uh -huh. And let me just see. We've got one more from 
actually skipping Twitter for a second, I'm going to go back to uh, how the media is talking about this, because Albana has talked about the mixed messages coming out of Kosovo. Um, in Serbia, I believe the Daily Danas had a big headline. Um, it said, a deal is done, I believe, in Latin. Um, what, how, how's the media reacting to, to this deal in, in Serbia? Well, I mean, uh, it's a pretty unified reaction, you know. There is not much controversy. All uh, the reactions coming from this nationalist uh, bloc, uh, all these reactions coming coming, for instance, from Mr. Vojislav Kostunica's uh, Serbian Democratic Party, which is a nationalist party, is expected, you know. But uh, I, I think uh, that in Serbia you don't have, you know, any danger when it comes to this nationalist bloc. It's too tiny, you know. Uh, I mean, Mr. Vucic and Mr. Nikolic came out of this Serbian radical party and formed the Serbian Progressive Party, and look what they did. They struck a deal with Kosovo. So the Serbian radical party and, you know, some uh, organization, nationalistic organizations like uh, very, you know, uh, gathering also sort of young nationalist people, disappointed people, um, I wouldn't appreciate, you know, that nationalist block too much. The, as I said, you know, the main stumbling block actually are the Kosovar Serbs. And, but, you know, saying that, you have to remember that they are financially dependent on Serbia. So ultimately, Serbia, you know, has a tool to deal with them. But, but Brenda, are you saying that there's no political cost for uh, for Prem Davids? I, I mean, he 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 did come from a, a nationalist coalition, isn't that isn't that correct? Or at least a more conservative coalition than the one he replaced. I'm not sure if I understood your question. Can you? Are you saying there's no political cost for him for for making these compromises, at least within Serbia? No, there is there is no there is no. I mean, uh, the ruling coalition consists of the Serbian Progressive Party, uh, Vucic, uh, President Tomislav Nikolic, uh, used to be a member of this party, and this party actually uh, came out of the Serbian Radical Party, which is the, you know, the top nationalistic party. And then you have Mr. Vojislav Kustunica, who is not too strong in the parliament. Mm -hmm. So actually, they don't have an opposition, a nationalist opposition within the parliament. And, you know, even if they did, their majority, you know, having 140-something, uh, you know, representatives in the parliament is a pretty comfortable majority. So I don't expect to see any significant, you know, any, any noisy protests in Belgrade or within Serbia. But I do expect to see that in, in North Mitrovica, in northern Kosovo. Yeah, and, and do you expect, uh, and this question will be, uh, I guess to both of you, do you expect to see that as early as tomorrow? Well, or on Monday? Come, uh, well, yeah, I do expect actually, you know, a lot of turmoil already on Monday in northern Mitrovica, in, in North Kosovo, yes. What about you, Arbana? Uh, yeah, definitely. They will begin with protest, but as we know, the powder keg is always there in Mitrovica North, so a protest can turn violent or can end peacefully. We'll just have to wait and see, but we have to uh, watch closely what's going on in northern Mitrovica. The, the reactions from there are very negative, starting from yesterday. Even in the morning before the, the both PMs have uh, reached the agreement, uh, they were uh, sending warning uh, statements to uh, Mr. Dacic, um, yes. and then uh, after the deal was reached, they were furious actually in their reactions, and they have said they will use every legitimate mean to stop the implementation of those 15 points. What are those means? We just have to wait and see, because uh, that part of Kosovo has been out of uh, Pristina's uh, control for long now, and Belgrade, yes, they do have financial support for Belgrade, but then again, they've had this for such a long time. 
it's been 14 years and now they have established their own financing, financing routes and mm -hmm. they have these structures, the, or, the organized crime is flourishing there. I might even quote uh, Thomas Countryman who was uh, the US state official two, two or three years ago uh, when I interviewed him, he called it the most lawless part of Europe. That's right, that's right, that's exactly right. I mean, you don't have any rule of law, either Kosovo's rule of law or, you know, Serbia, the state of Serbia's rule of law there. It's been lawless, you know, for several decades, for at least two decades, and, you know, you have contraband there, everything. So these guys are, you know, I mean, I don't imagine them as, as it's, you know, as poor people, those leaders there, you know, who can, who can uh, get together and, uh, and start doing crazy things, you know. I absolutely expect that and I wonder how, how Nikolic Vucic and Dacic are going to deal with them. I simply don't have the answer and, and uh, you know, I, I'm scared. I'm scared about what's going to happen in, in, in North Kosovo in the next days. So this actually, I mean, this, this seems like, uh, you know, basically what everyone said, this is an ext uh, historic agreement. Our issue is actually implementing this agreement. And how do you implement something in a place where I think the, I think we could say the majority of people living in that area in northern Kosovo do not want this plan implemented? I mean, there's got to be, you, what, what comes next? And I don't know, maybe, Ricard, maybe you might well, have something to say. I, I, you, to, to be honest with you, I, I really don't know what's going to happen uh, on the ground there. But one important aspect that I think we have forgotten here as well is actually the role of NATO uh, that we haven't mentioned yet. Uh, exact, directly after the deal uh, yesterday, both Ashton, Dacic and Tachi went to see uh, the NATO sec gen and as Phil Grasmussen, and he's indicated that he's he, he's willing to that NATO is willing to have their fair share of, of this agreement as well. But that means uh, it's not really sure yet. I mean, the NATO's involvement here is not really on paper. Uh, but we have K4, the, the the NATO force in in Kosovo will will play a large role. And already now there are many uh, members of NATO that are actually being questioning as well, uh, does this mean that K4 will have new uh, commitments as well? So uh, the question I really would ask, and perhaps also if Branka and Arbana can talk about this, is what what do you think NATO will do now? Because uh, they are a very important play in this. They, this. they are not really part of this agreement, even though they are, uh, but not on paper. Yeah, okay. I mean, this is a very controversial question, because Mr. Dacic, uh, is presenting the deal with NATO as if NATO promised to stop a future security force of Kosovo to enter the north of Kosovo except for an emergency case, for a potential emergency case. And I'm not quite sure if that is the deal. Can you, can you Richard, say more about this point? This is the question, is that uh and nothing is on paper, and we really don't know what the deal with Kosovo, with, with the NATO is, actually. Uh, what I do know, however, is that main, many diplomats, especially once again from Germany, uh, also from Netherlands, they're questioning now, uh, it, they really don't want NATO to have any more commitments that they already have in, in, in Kosovo. So uh, I think rather than uh, also about the EU uh, having question marks, what we really should ask as well is, what, what NATO will do now, and uh, there's no clear answer to that one yet. There's something that we may find out uh, on Tuesday when foreign, NATO foreign ministers meet in Brussels. Right. Hard to say. I mean, this is the toughest question, you know, that you, the, the, that you put. What about the implementation? Because mm. this is nothing, you know. I mean, if we have a, uh, words or a paper, you know, Mm. Uh, if even historic, it's, it just doesn't, you know, doesn't play any role if we cannot implement it. Yeah. Or if we have a flare-up, you know, if we have a, perhaps a conflict between mm. those Serbs, you know, who may start, you know, putting barricades and, you know... And what will they to do then, basically? Exactly, That's what we don't know. Exactly, okay, we may see 
we may see again, you know, some scenes that we used to see two years yeah, ago. Absolutely. You know, a flare up and a clash with between northern Kosovo, Serbs and NATO. Mm. I don't exclude this scenario. I mean, I don't wish for it, of course, but I cannot exclude it either, unfortunately. Uh, do, do you guys about you, Arbana? Um, well, the, the, the NATO and the K4 will, of course, even if we call them now, they will just say that NATO, K4 is here to secure a safe and secure environment. That's their mantra. Uh, <clears throat> what I see uh, as a, uh, mistaken steps by EU when it comes not to only implementing this agreement but to implementing the other agreements as well. Uh, there is this paradox situation in Kosovo. You have, uh, the EU has the biggest ever mission that it had until now is in Kosovo, right? So, uh, Kosovans don't have the, the Civilization Association agreement as yet, they don't have the visa liberalization as yet, and they have, they have been inventing these new criteria and new documents for Kosovo. Now, let's say that we are talking to a Serb in northern Kosovo. Let's begin with practical reasons. Would he rather take a Kosovo passport or a Serbia's passport? Uh, with Kosovo's passport, he can travel to Serbia probably because he's Serb. He can do that more freely now. He can go to Macedonia, Montenegro, and Albania, and that's about it. Maybe Turkey. Yep, yeah, yep, Turkey too. Yep, yep. And if he has a Serbian passport, he's a he's a Schengen free zone. He can use that uh, for the Schengen zone. So I, I'm just beginning to think of an ordinary citizen. What would he or she do if? If I were a Serb and if I was living in northern Mitrovica, I would take the Serbian passport because that would mean traveling abroad, that would mean more prosperity for, for my children or for my family. So I think that once the EU would treat uh, equally the, the stakeholders in this dialogue, then we would have had some kind of a field for normalization and for implementing loyalty the agreement. As long as a stakeholder is on a higher position in EU and the other one is, is being blocked, I don't think there's going to be, uh, uh, the steps will not be as easy as we think, or as one might think. Hmm. Uh, I, you know, this, this may be my final question, and, and it also came from Twitter. Uh, we, we mentioned earlier, um, we had talked about Serbia's integration to the EU. Um, Part of the goal of this deal is that um, Serbia is, is, is not supposed to block Kosovo's movements now. Um, what's, what's Kosovo's path? I mean, what, what happens next with Kosovo? Kosovo uh, will now have to, uh, basically, um, the, Kosovo has, uh, the, they have numerous strategies and numerous visions and numerous uh, platforms that they will going to use now, they probably will use it. I, I was reading yesterday that maybe a new campaign of lobbying for Kosovo's recognition will begin to add up the numbers. It's uh, something below 100 until now and, and it's been five years since independence. So uh, they're going to try and <clears throat> do uh, what they have been doing until now and they may be testing the agreement. But uh, probably I presume that Kosovo government will now take this agreement once it's sent and signed and ratified or whatever procedure there are needed for it, um, it, it will call upon that agreement and first, the first thing is I think they will try to gain more, more statehood recognitions from the countries that have not recognized Kosovo. So what's a, what's a critical period is it, to, to to watch and see if this thing gets implemented. It sounds like it's a pretty short uh, timeline that we have. Right I would now. I would watch for April 26 because by then there should be uh, some kind of a time frame set by April 26 and we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. Great. Do, does, anyone, do, does anyone feel like I missed anything? We're still in this hangout, so if, if, is there anything you want to add? Well, okay. Uh, the toughest question, as I said, is the implementation, and uh, I'm afraid we are going to see, you know, lots of gatherings, protests, and uh, perhaps even more violent, violent uh, episodes, you know, in northern Kosovo, starting already Monday.
you know, because they will do their best now to try to, uh, you know, to try to, in a way, um, how shall I say, to, 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 to attack uh, the united front, if you wish, you know, of the Serbian top leaders. They will probably play that card, you know, counting on President uh, Nikolic, who is much more conservative than Vucic and Dacic on the other side. And they will, they will try their best, you know, in order not to implement that, those leaders in, in, in the north of Kosovo. And, uh, and that's, that, that's really an open question. I mean, nobody can know more than you now, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen on a daily basis. But I'm afraid it's going to be, you know, very, very, very dangerous things on a daily basis in the north of Kosovo. And, I mean, the worst, things, the worst thing of all is that you cannot say who has authority over those services in the north, in, in the north of Kosovo. It seems to be that there is no, no player, no stakeholder, you know, it's not Mr. Hashim Daci, it's obviously not Nikolic or Daci and Vucic in Serbia. It's not the European Union. Well, and, you know, you know, I mean, nobody has political credibility enough, you know, according to their criteria, you know, to try to influence them. Well, I mean, it, it sounds, I, I think if I've, we've gotten anything out of this, it sounds like a historic agreement has been signed, uh, but implementation is going to be a long road. Travel. Yeah, that's exactly so. Yeah. Uh, maybe the the I, I might might correct you. It has not been signed. It's been initialed on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so and it, it might I, not be signed either, yeah, actually. Exactly. Yeah. That's my point. This is why why I wanted to connect to that to what Glenn said. Now it's important who's going to sign it. Mm. Uh, who's going to sign mm. it? Who's going to be the guarantee? I know the the implementation committee will be is foreseen to be established, but who's going to sign it from Kosovo's part and who's going to sign it from Serbia's part? Yeah. From Kosovo's part, if the Prime Minister signs it, that's fine, he has the majority. From Serbia's side, and Branka might help me here, if uh, Mr. Dacic signs it, that means the Progressive Party will sign it. Is that a problem? I, I don't really know. I mean, uh, Mr. Mr. Dacic is the Prime Minister. So it's gonna be it's gonna be you know on a government session. I don't see any problem you know um, adopting this document and then it goes to the parliament, and uh, they have a you know a pretty good majority there, a pretty comfortable majority there. So the final step is that uh, you know that uh, it it be ratified by the parliament. But would Mr. Vucic like? Uh, uh use that as a tool for his next political move, like I didn't sign it, you sign it? No, I don't think so, I don't think so. All right, I mean, uh, I, I understand why you put this question, I mean, and that's perfectly okay. Um, there is this, uh, there is this, uh, I hear those voices, I don't know if I'm heard or not. I think that's okay. right. Yeah, you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay, at some point in time, you know, during this negotiating process, uh, the European Union invited Mr. Vucic to join the Serbian team, being afraid that Mr. Dacic might not be too stable within this governing coalition in Serbia, and they were right to do that, you know. They just want to, wanted to make sure that if Dacic is toppled, you know, if you have an overhaul, of the government here in Serbia or an early election and Vucic becomes the Prime Minister instead of Dacic because this is the party that, uh, you know, within the coalition, Vucic's party, Serbian Progressive Party is by far the, 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 the strongest party within the coalition. Why they, in a way, uh, you know, just gave the, this Prime Ministership to Mr. Dacic after the election is just to secure that they come to power. 
So they didn't make a big deal, you know, who is going to be the prime minister, whether it's going to be from the Serbian Progressive Party of, or from the Socialist Party, who was the kingmaker, actually. And, you know, uh, because of this kingmaker, of Mr. Dacic, they came to power, actually, Vucic and, uh, and Nikolic. So, um, but, you know, I mean, if there should be an early election in Serbia, and that is not to be excluded, uh, then most likely Mr. Vucic will become a new Prime Minister. So the European Union, of course, sensed it and uh, they were very clever to join, uh, to in a way, uh, you know, jo say to Mr. Vucic to join the negotiating team. Uh, but I don't think that, you know, you can talk about uh, any blackmails now or possible blackmails on the Vucic side, you know saying to Dacic, if you sign this, you know, you're going to be toppled. No, I'm not afraid of that. All right, so I think that with that, I'm going to try to wrap this up. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining this hangout. It's uh, one of the first we've done of this kind, so thank you very much. Um, in Brussels, RFRL correspondent Ricard Uzviak, uh, in Belgrade, Branka Vivic, and in Pristina, Albana Vidicici. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. All the best. All the best, all the best to all of you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.